Alrighty, so welcome everyone. This is the last event for the Egg Solidarity Network launch week that started on Monday. Um, and we're really excited to have Greg, Daniel, and Carol here. Um, they presented our most popular workshop at the Organic Farming Conference this year on growing in a deep winter greenhouse. And so um, they're presenting on the same topic today and um, this recording will be available um, to share for folks who are interested um, on our YouTube channel afterwards as well. Um, my name is Victoria. I am the Farmer Network Manager at Marble Seed, and I'm kind of overseeing this week-long um, Egg Solidarity Network launch week. And I also am available to answer questions about the Egg Solidarity Network. If anyone has any, my contact information is all over the site, so you can find me there. Um, and yeah, I'll just pass it over to our presenters and we'll get started. Great. Thanks, Dan. If you want to share your screen um, and put up the presentation, I'll get us kicked off. <clears throat> All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to our uh, Deep Winter Greenhouse presentation. So um, this is a First slide here, you can see this is a depiction of our newer farm scale deep winter greenhouse design. We'll be talking about that a little bit later. Dan, if you want to just click to the next one, let me get us started here. So I'm with the University of Minnesota Extension's Regional Sustainable Development Partnerships. Uh, we also have Carol Ford from Garden Goddess Produce. Uh, you might, if any of you were attending the uh, Marble Seed Conference, we had um, Brooke Nisley from Alternative <laughs> Roots Farm. So today we're switching it up a little bit. We have Carol Ford, who's been along on this journey longer than any of us. She's kind of the pioneer of this deep winter greenhouse movement. So we're excited to have her present a little bit about her experiences and to teach us a little bit about winter growing. And we have Dan Handeen from the University of Minnesota's Center for Sustainable Building Research, who is the designer of the uh, of two of the deep winter greenhouse models, the smaller deep winter greenhouse 2.2 design and the farm scale deep winter greenhouse, both of which were are available for free for download on our um, deep winter greenhouse website. Just Google UMN DWG and you'll find it'll pop up right on the top. All right, wanna move us? A little bit of background about who we are. Uh, my program in the University of Minnesota Extension, the Regional Sustainable Development Partnerships, we work in greater Minnesota in five regions across four topic areas, clean energy, natural resources, resilient communities, and sustainable agriculture. What we do is we help community groups, community organizations, farmers, individuals, anybody in greater Minnesota who are working on sustainable agriculture product projects, community-based sustainable ag projects, or, or clean energy, natural resources, resilient communities projects, we help connect them with University of Minnesota resources. And you can go to the next slide then. And this is how it started with Deep Winter Greenhouses as well. About 10 years ago, Carol Ford and Chuck Wabel uh, were concerned about high costs of energy and climate change. And at the time, uh, peak oil was big in everybody's mind. They decided to do something about it, built a small passive solar greenhouse on the south side of their garage, and then connected with the University of Minnesota's regional partnerships to get help publishing the Northlands Winter Greenhouse Manual. So we did that, we connected them and we got that manual published. And then from that point on, the idea and the movement gained a whole lot of excitement. More and more people were interested, more and more people started building these. So we were able to bring Carol on to, um, to be a winter production educator. And so um, that is roughly how this whole concept and project started, start, got started within the university. And we've moved, been moving forward ever since. I'm gonna pump me forward. Here are the reasons why, some of the reasons why our uh, regional partnerships board and work group members around the state are interested in this work and why I'm interested as well. Um, you know, I think about 10 years ago, a lot of these things were um, things that people kind of had in the back of their mind. We need to, you know, shore up our regional and local food systems because the future might be unstable. And there are some of these ideas we have that we know might be happening and they've come to pass and they're continuing to come to pass. The drought in California has, has been long going. In the last 10 years, we've had two mega droughts. It's probably the same drought with a wet period in between. 
Uh, and it's although it's alleviated by now, when you look at uh, the left two pictures here, we've got California and we've got Yuma, Arizona. All of our crops are grown in the desert. Almost all of 100% of the uh, vegetable crops in the U.S. outside of the pieces that we grow at our little farmers markets and CSAs and the little local things here and there, almost all of our vegetable crops, a certain number of veggies are grown in this area that's extremely drought prone. We've also had extreme wildfires, um, you know, putting plumes of, of uh, toxic smoke in the air and, and uh, changing weather patterns. And then where I live, we've had unrest and we've had COVID, everybody's had COVID, but we've had all of these things going on very recently that signify we really need to shore up our regional local uh, food supply chains because things break down and we can't rely on what's out there. We need to make it, we need to make it secure so that we can have food going forward. Uh, next slide. Real quickly, this is how it works. Dan might get into a little bit more of this uh, in the, in his slides, but the deep winter greenhouse that you see in the middle here, it's an outline. The hot air comes in through a self-facing glazing angle. That's the angle is optimized to make the most amount of solar heat come in uh, rather than bounce back off into space. Once inside that heat rises to the top and is collected through this intake manifold, which then a little tiny fan takes that hot air down under the ground into a bed of rocks. In this case, a bed of crushed rocks, which serves as a, a thermal mass heat battery. That heat stored underground, it's drawn from one manifold to the other through a little outtake fan here. And that hot air is available at night when the sun goes down and the and the environment inside starts to cool down, that air kind of comes back out and is enable, enables this growing space to remain above freezing most of the time. There's also very clear, you need to have backup heat. This isn't a standalone system on uh, consecutive cloudy days. It will dip below freezing, so you need to have some backup heat. But regardless, this creates a unique environment that's really, really conducive to growing specific certain vegetable crops probably many others or some others, but specific vegetable crops of salad greens and brassicas. It's a great environment for them and enables these crops to really thrive. And, um, and it creates a, a growing opportunity for farmers to create a crop and sell a crop in the winter where they otherwise might not be able to. All right, next. I will just jump in to reemphasize though, as far as how we're defining a deep winter greenhouse and specifically what this presentation is about and geared around. Um, and that is uh, we're optimizing, the design of these structures is optimized for winter production. That's not you know necessarily year round, it's not shoulder seasons, it's really trying to attack that, that window of time between say November into March, something like that. Um, the other defining characteristic of a deep winter greenhouse, at least as far as the U of M con is concerned, is that we're also using some kind of thermal energy storage. That is, we're trying to store heat when we've got extra and be able to have that available to us when we need it. And that is achieved typically through a large thermal mass, um, i.e. rock bed or soil. So. Great, thanks. And then um, real quickly, I'd just like to say we were able to um, expound on the older designs that Carol and some others made. The top left greenhouse was Carol's, still is Carol's, and the bottom one is another greenhouse similar. We uh, went in, took UV cameras in, uh, measured where heat was getting, um, was losing, where, where cold air was coming in, looked at the designs and found some sort of like tweaks that needed to be made and put this design together for a standalone uh, passive solar greenhouse that any farmer could in theory build, even if they didn't have a self-facing shed or somewhere to put it. So those, this is our first design. It's available online and there's the nice picture on top of the rendering. And I'm just always impressed sometimes at how exactly like the renderings, the real things look. So this is our greenhouse in Finland, Minnesota. So onward, I'm passing it to Carol. Thanks. Carol, you're on mute. Oh, Let's try go. that again, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> or I could just keep mouthing and someone could put, you know, sound in there. But, but this is uh, about the production in the DWG. And it begins, of course, with soil. Uh, although one of the features of it is that we try to maximize the space in the deep winter greenhouse. So it's a 3D growing system. It's not just all on the floor. 
And the way we do that is that we use what you can see here in this photograph. These are um, planters made out of sections of PVC uh, gutters for homes. And they come in uh, lengths of 10. So we cut them in three drill holes in the bottom. There are end caps you can buy or else uh, I've also made them out of other materials. And they get put, I'll show some, um, the, you'll see some pictures soon of how they get hung in the greenhouse. And then also in, there are choices that deep winter greenhouse people can make as far as whether they want to use the floor as a growing space by having raised beds or just stick with um, these, these gutters. And as we go along, I'll, I'll show you some of the different features that we've been. Um, so this is my greenhouse right on the left. And you can see that I do have raised beds that at the bottom, those little perfect, beautiful purple ones are, are uh, purple pak choy. And we've tested a lot of, of different things in these and have come up with the, it, mostly in the, in the gutters, you'll see that we're growing salad greens and some of the larger crops, like there's a, so besides the pak choy, that other one there, what the heck is that? I can't quite see it. I know in the back that there was, um, yeah, anyway, Greg's telling me, move on, Carol. <laughs> okay, next. Another system for the gutters is, is this kind of framework. And you can see the structure of it on the left side and how much uh, material you can actually pack into these things. And you can tear them behind. So you're catching uh, more of the sunlight. I do also know a person who built a deep winter greenhouse is actually two stories high. At the back of it, uh, they grow flats of different kinds of grasses for their small uh, animals on their farm uh, in the winter time. And it, it, they say it really boosts the health of their animals. So let's do the next one. So this is a, a snapshot of just some of the stuff that we, we grow. Mostly it's brassicas because they can handle the cool in the evening in the wintertime. So that first one is a purple pak choy. Oh yeah, the second one I couldn't tell, that's a mustard. And then the next one is a, is a purple kale. It's absolutely gorgeous in the winter. All of these colored crops get, as you can see, much deeper color than they get in the summer. And the next one is a chard. The one down below on the left is um, a hawkery turnip. We don't do a lot of root crops in the greenhouse because it's actually uh, makes more sense to grow those outdoors and store them in the winter. But these are little baby guys that go great in salads and you can also eat the greens. The one next to that is uh, two, two different varieties of the same uh, mustard. Um, I know it's golden frills and red frills, I think is what those are called. Next to that is a broccoli plant, which I don't grow in the greenhouse anymore because it's, you don't eat the leaves and they take up a lot of space. So I do broccoli rob now instead of that, but it, it has the same kind of size structure. So I put that in there. And the last one is a, is a daikon radish. I do some of these smaller root crops in the spring because they grow pretty quickly. And it's just a nice, you know, added thing for uh, people who are looking for something to buy before everything's in the ground. This is where they get started. There's a, a shelf unit at the back of my greenhouse where I lay down all of these things, fill them with soil and seeds. And there's uh, heat mats beneath them and that helps give them a good start. And the one next to it is that uh, another one of those purple varieties. That's, that's just gone out into uh, the slings because it's big enough. I usually wait until they've got four at least true leaves before they go off the heat and, and into the slings or into the ground. Next. And over here on the side, I think that one is a, a loose leaf cabbage. You can see in that middle one, how well these things can grow even in the middle of winter when there's snow packing up to the south side. Um, and the, what I try to do is figure out these three different seasons that we have. At the beginning of the winter, the days are starting to shorten and some plants respond to that by slowing down their growth, others don't. And on our website, there is a list of all these different crops and when they work best in the winter season. So you can get more detail on that if you'd like. But this middle one really kind of shows you how 
in my system with uh, the gutters that are hanging, um, that's what I do. I think if I was going hardcore commercial, I would probably do more like the um, those wood shelves because you can get more plants in there. And if you're trying to make a living and getting more income in the winter, you've got to have as much going as you can. Okay, let's do the next one. Um, one of one of the things we try to emphasize to people who are thinking about doing this, besides the the amazing satisfaction and pleasure you get out of growing food in the winter time and being in a space when it's twenty below outside and it's eighty degrees and humid where you're working, uh, but also there's a real need and a growing desire in rural communities where where we work for um, being able to get fresh produce locally because a lot of what comes here on the trucks has been in those trucks for a while and it's kind of crummy but um, with this we get the, the best advantages as far as what those crops give us um, and it, it gives the farmers a revenue a revenue during the winter which otherwise they just they can't have and uh, what I've seen in, in working with these things is that providing a structure like this that strengthens resilient local food systems it gets more people inspired to work in it as well and so that's that's one of the real pleasures of it and the picture here is when i had a, a group of people come in who were really interested in doing this and the woman to the right actually did build a deep winter greenhouse and so did the one in the middle but you can't really see her face but they were <laughs> they really wanted to get down in there with those vegetables and check it out so that was good okay next And finally, one of the things that we've been looking at is how to extend the amount of time that the deep winter greenhouse can be beneficial to a grower. And so we've used, we've, I've tried a lot of different things. In the middle of the hot summer when nothing can grow in the deep winter greenhouse, I've used it um, to dry different crops, you know, like tomatoes and peppers and, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and it's also a time, I mean, we did do some experimenting with tomatoes and that that's worked out okay. Um, getting them growing in the greenhouse when less of the other plants are there because spring, spring's coming to an end and it's getting too hot. I have grown um, tomatoes in there in large pots that then can be moved outside. So there's different things you can kind of play around with in there. Uh, but the really important thing is is not looking at fall as a time to bring outdoor plants into the deep winter greenhouse because the chances of them potentially having insects and pests that could really wreak havoc is too high. Um, so I don't bring outdoor plants or house plants into the deep winter greenhouse. And I use that time instead to do all of the prep work for what's gonna happen in the winter of you know acquiring all of the materials for the soil that you need and making sure if you've got raised beds, they're ready to go, or that all of the um, planters have been cleaned and disinfected and are ready to go, and making sure that all of the mechanical parts of it are, are good to go, and storing all your supplies where you need them. Um, understanding that a lot of that stuff, if you just put it out in your packing shed, it's gonna freeze. So if there's a spot in there that you can store some of that stuff so it's ready to go, that's good. Okay, next. And this is really just a reminder like, oh boy, I like seeing this one on the left because it just shows how that, from what we saw when it's all full, when it's all just getting started and ready to go, it's a good time to bring people in there because you can still get some room. And there's a lot of great questions. And again, the woman on the right is the one that built one herself. She built a huge one. And um, the hope is that every time we get more people in and seeing these deep winter greenhouses that they're going to see the possibilities for their own communities. And it's, it's fun to be a part of helping them get there. Thanks, Carol. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll follow on to that by talking a little bit about, um, well, very briefly, the different types of uses that people have for the greenhouses. And some people, you know, get a space like this going and they're, you know, just trying different things. I know there's uh, like tropical plant and tropical fruit enthusiasts that are working on propagating tissue culture that they can um, 
you know, basically start and then sell to other interested folks up here in the great north. But uh, um, if you're concerned about uh, making money off of these, there's a number of different uh, possibilities. And so um, I think both of these shots show um, people or examples where they're really trying to maximize the space in there. Um, but of course, part of this consideration is how much this thing cost. And so I um, wanted to share some construction costs. And these ones, I want to be clear, these ones are for the V2.2 prototype design. And this was the one that was shown at the beginning of the presentation that's got that steep glazing wall. Um, Greg commented about how the rendering looked like the uh, actual built project. That was this. That's this one. And that one was really designed um, to be kind of the the pinnacle, if you will, right? It's just kind of like the best uh, considerations with regard to passive solar design, um, air movement, size of the thermal energy storage, um, and the you know the insulated parts of the enclosure. Um, so, and the great thing was that we were able to have them open. You know, people could tour them, they get all inspired, and then you know they see something like this chart, and they're like, okay, that's all fine and dandy, but that's a lot of money. So we basically went back to the drawing board and, uh, you know, tried to come up with something that's um, a little bit cheaper, a little more, more accessible and um, a fair amount larger. And so um, the analogy that I draw is that if the V2.2 is kind of like the uh, Formula E electric uh, F1 racer, um, you know, the, which, you know, gets people excited. It's iconic. It's got a very particular shape you know, because of the demands or the, you know, as is driven by passive solar design. It's got a big thermal energy storage. It's got a big battery. So really high performance, but it's, again, optimized for winter conditions. It's highly responsive, but you, you know, it's a little bit finicky, right? Just like a performance sports car. Um, and it's not easily adaptable. There's not a whole lot of things that you can change about this very easily that aren't going to negatively affect the, uh, the performance somehow. Um, and then lastly, of course, it's expensive. Right, so maybe not everybody needs a uh, Formula One electric race car. Maybe somebody wants something more along the lines of a Prius wagon. So that's what we're attempting to do with the farm scale deep winter greenhouse. Um, the basic elements that we've brought forth uh, for the farm scale winter greenhouse are um, increased size, as I mentioned. It's roughly about um, three times the size of the uh, V2.2 footprint. And um, along with that, we've got some, you know, partly because of the, you know, the scaling of it, and then partly because of the different uh, styles of, of wall assembly that we have in there, we've got a reduced cost per square foot by about two thirds as well. Um, we've got a more robust insulated wall system. Um, my background is in uh, building science. And uh, so, um, you know, this is really with an eye to being conscious and uh, kind of planning for where moisture is going to move through uh, these these systems and th move through these buildings, quite frankly, um, and then trying to anticipate where that can happen safely, right? So we don't get things like rot. Um, the uh, basic structure is that it's, um, it's kind of like a half hoop house and half insulated shed. And so that hoop house section is literally, you know, off the shelf from a, you know, a hoop house, standard hoop house manufacturer. Um, the only custom portion of it is a, is a little leg stand that attaches the um, metal trusses of the hoop house uh, portion of it up to the, uh, the ridge beam. Um, uh, I look at this structure as being more or less modular. That is the, uh, the enclosure that goes above the soil is independent of what type of energy storage uh, system or technique you decide to use. That is, um, depending on your site conditions or your budget or your availability of, you know, inch and a half river rock or you know a you know buddy with an excavator or something like that. Um, you know, depend. There's a wide range of potential conditions, right? Um, so, you know, and those of course are going to affect how long uh, or how much heat you have in reserve, but um, the shell still acts kind of independently. It's gonna do a good job, a robust job of keeping that heat um, within the enclosure, regardless of what type of energy storage method you have below. Um, you could also conceivably um, lengthen or shorten the, uh, the shell um, in the east and west uh, direction. 
um, depending on you know how big of a, a, a project you want to you want to take on. Um, the other thing here, and I, 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 there's an asterisk for this last one here. Um, ventilation is an issue. I'll be, I'll be right up front with that. Uh, with the, um, the new design, because of the shallower glazing angle, essentially, we get a ton of solar heat gain coming into this greenhouse, and it's really tricky to, to balance that, especially in shoulder seasons like we've got right now, where it might be, you know, nice and chilly at night. Uh, but um, we've got plenty of full sun and really pretty warm temperatures during the day. Um, so figuring out how you can exhaust excess heat and, you know, really try and potentially uh, reduce excess solar gain uh, when the sun is shining. Um, those are challenges that we're, that we're working on addressing. Here's the basic footprint. As you can see, it's roughly 60 feet from east to west and roughly 20 feet from north to south. Um, the reason that it's oriented this way is so that we can have better control over the amount of solar gain that's coming in here. Um, you'll see a lot of conventional hoop houses and so forth oriented uh, with the long direction or the long axis to the north-south. Um, and that, you know, that helps with overheating and that sort of thing. But those are really, again, designed for the shoulder seasons, right? Um, this is designed to maximize capture of solar energy in the deep winter when that sun is really low in the sky, right? Um, other, some other design features of this uh, are these kind of... Um, lobbies or uh you know packing sheds if you will um they're really designed to act as kind of an airlock so that we've got um you know a, a door that seals both on both sides of these uh so that you're not just opening up directly to the exterior um, in the middle of the winter time when you're trying to access your greenhouse um here it is in section and i'll just point out oops sorry oops i'll just point out a couple things um, with regard to the design. This side is obviously that Gothic style hoop house um, segment. Uh, these are, you know, I think they're inch and a half tubular galvanized steel trusses, um, standard purlins here, um, you know, with a slightly denser spacing as it goes around the radius. And then we actually have a double wall polycarbonate on this, on the, um, on this greenhouse, I would probably recommend triple wall polycarbonate just so there isn't quite as much heat loss. Um, a little bit trickier to get that radius, but we're right at the kind of, um, you know, the limits of what that can actually bend to um, with this with this radius. Um, other things here are the wall assembly. Um, um, for any of the walls that are not uh, clear, <laughs> right, they're not getting solar energy coming through them. We're trying to insulate as much as possible, and so we do that with um, essentially a standard two by four stud construction on the interior. You can see that here; it's completely exposed. It's open on the inside, and we we leave that open. You know, there's no interior finish on here. We leave the stud cavities open so that uh, moisture can basically move to and from those spaces and actually move in and out of the wood safely, so that they can dry out. Um, so that we're not trapping uh, moisture in the wall assemblies. So what we've done instead then is move all of our, what we call the control layers, that's control for vapor, for bulk water, that is rain um, and raindrops, that sort of thing. And uh, our thermal control, our insulation, that's all moved to the exterior of the structure. And so that happens here. There's a thin layer you can see right here. This is the sheathing. Basically that gives us our shear strength for the structure. Outside of that, we've got a layer of, uh, uh, it's a, uh, a Tyvek commercial wrap. It's got a kind of crinkle uh, texture to it, and that allows water to drain actually um, behind the insulation. Um, this insulation is a uh, expanded polystyrene, um, very similar to standard uh, um, like white styrofoam that you might see for packing materials and that sort of thing. However, the one that we've spec'd here is a special one called Neopore, and this is a special one that's used for residential insulation. The difference being that it's got uh, it's got graphite actually that's mixed in with the polystyrene mix, and that helps um, with uh, to prevent radiative uh, heat transfer. Um, so it gives a slight boost in in insulative performance um, over just standard white styrofoam. The reason that uh, I'm recommending expanded polystyrene in this case um, in this location, I'll be clear about that and come back to that point in just a second, um, is that. Uh, it has a relatively lower environmental impact in its production um, as opposed to some other types of insulation. Uh, expanded polystyrene relatively 
again, in comparison to some other insulation types and uh, foam insulations, um, it has lower environmental impact. Um, so then outside of that, uh, basically, we've got some furring strips that kind of hold the insulation back. Actually, there's long screws that go all the way from the exterior of the furring strip through the insulation and back into the stud. So, you know, they're nice seven inch long screws to get through all that insulation. There's four, inch of, four inches of insulation, which uh, adds up to about R20. Um, and then exterior of that, we've got what we call a rain screen cladding system. And that's basically just any standard siding. Um, and literally, you could use anything you wanted to on the exterior of this. The rain screen uh, system is agnostic of whatever type of siding you have. You could put, you know, salvaged wood, you could put vinyl, you could put, you know, what we've done so far is we put metal siding up, just standard kind of Menards Pro Rib, uh, you know, corrugated siding. Um, and uh, so I have a couple shots of um, a couple builds that we've done here in the city of Minneapolis. We partnered uh, with the city and a couple local nonprofit food advocacy organizations. Um, we have two of them built, as I mentioned. One is in the Phillips neighborhood off of 15th and just between 27th and 20th, 28th avenues um, in uh, South Minneapolis. And that was built in partnership with a group called uh, Tamale CBC Cletas. And then in North Minneapolis, that's where this particular image is. Um, we've built one in partnership with um, a group called Appetite for Change. And uh, both of these groups working to um, basically help provide more food security and more food sovereignty for uh, the communities, the very local communities in which they're, uh, they're located. Um, and so this is, uh, this is construction of one of them. We've got the framing up, obviously. Um, and this is the sheathing going up, this green portion here. This is a special type of OSB uh, paneling that has a, um, it's essentially the green stuff is a waterproof barrier on the outside. And so it, it uh, doesn't let any, you know, like I said, bulk water raindrops and, and, you know, melted snow, that sort of thing, it doesn't let it soak into the OSB. Once the seams of these uh, panels are taped, then it effectively becomes the, the water barrier um, for the structure. And here it is continuing to go up. Um, I guess I should mention briefly that we've got both of uh, the farm scale winter greenhouses that we have in the city of Minneapolis on what we call a grade beam type of foundation. And this is to basically um, you know, spread out the really pretty modest uh, loads, the gravitational loads of these structures, because, you know, there's not a whole lot to them. Um, you know, obviously no second floors or attics or that sort of thing. Um, but uh, with a relatively low footprint, you, of course, could put these on a standard block foundation, frost-free foundation, something like that. But because both of these locations are on um, essentially vacant lots that had uh, previous structures that had been demolished and then literally pushed into the basement and then kind of covered up with some topsoil. There was a lot of debris right underneath the soil surface. And so we are trying to go as shallow as possible. Um, the other uh, reason for doing that is that we're trying to make this relatively easy to disassemble and take away, um, you know, should the situation ever arise that, um, you know, the, the lot gets used for something else in the future. Um, so that's what you see here, this, these black uh, pieces here are actually a, um, it's a recycled plastic timber. Um, so of course that's waterproof, rot proof, you know, conceivably we could, uh, reuse that, that, those, uh, those elements, um, in the future when this, uh, gets deconstructed. Um, this is a schematic of the wall assembly. Um, here you can see that green exterior and that OSB. This is basically right along the glazing wall. And so we, we've got is a waterproof tape that laps over from the glazing right over the top of the OSB. So we're basically including the glazing wall as part of the, the, the uh, you know, the airtight enclosure, essentially, that's making this, 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 uh, this structure. We've got the four inches, that's two layers of two inches a piece, uh, XPS foam. Here's the furring strip that holds that all together. And then here's the cladding that would get attached back to the, the ring, I'm sorry, to the, uh, the furring strip here. Um, it's important to also note here with this type of wall section that it's okay if the insulation gets wet, actually. Um, the point being that it can readily dry out. That's part of the point of the rain screen system. It allows air to circulate behind the siding so that uh, it can draw moisture back out of the wall assembly if it does get wet or when it does get wet, right? We're literally planning um, for this to be able to dry out. Um, so here's what it looks like. You can see that end or that sidewall condition where that schematic just was illustrated right here. Um, all the seams taped, of course, here. This is starting to see the uh, the uh, trusses for the glazing wall. 
up in place. You can see there's some purlins across here for additional uh, racking support. Um, and then up here, you can see these, these are the custom leg pieces that are basically bolted into this LDL ridge beam that, that accept the end of the uh, each of these trusses. And here we are tightening things up and we're installing the windows. The windows here, um, you know, I was looking for a nice, cheap and readily available kind of option for windows, something that was easy to use, uh, found these. They're basic, basically a, a hopper type basement window from Menards. They were, gosh, I think they were like 24 bucks a piece or something like that. And granted, this was three years ago now, so they're probably more expensive now. I liked them because they were double glazed, you know, so you've got some extra insulation in the in the glazing uh, hopper type. So rain doesn't come into the space. They have a screen on the outside. They've got a, a vinyl gasket that goes around the outside. They would lock. But um, I you know, they were a little bit too good to be true. I'll just say that they they actually leak air down right next to the hinges. And so we've seen frost build up actually in the wintertime in these places. Um, and I, I guess just as, a, as an aside, both of these farm scale um, winter greenhouses, of course, they're, you know, in the middle of the city. And one of the concerns during construction and, uh, you know, ongoing operation was, you know, security of the of the site. And uh, at first I thought, oh, these are small enough. Like nobody can fit in there. Well, I was wrong. Um, <laughs> we had a number of uh, um, break-ins actually where folks figured out how to, you know, basically tear through the screen and figured out how to unlock it from the outside and, you know, shimmied their way up into the space. So um, if that is a concern for you at your site, um, I would say go with a, you know, a stronger exterior kind of uh, bar on the outside or a different type of window altogether. So um, moving ahead of just a little bit here, this has got now the black insulation that's been installed on the outside. We've got the furring strips in place to hold that in. Um, we've Everything is essentially dried in, if you will, right? Everything. So that's why it's okay that it's out in the wintertime like this. No big deal. There's no cladding on this right now. There's no siding, right? That's going to go over these furring strips. But again, like I said, the, the system is designed to be able to accept moisture and be able to dry out. And so we're not really concerned about all the snow melt and so forth on here. Um, another view from the back side. And uh, another schematic of what happens up at that, that joint between the north wall and the roof here. Again, we're trying to maintain continuity between all of the different control layers here, right? We've got the green and the black here, that's our our you know weather barrier essentially the Tyvek that's this piece right in here as I mentioned before that kind of crinkled stuff um, that allows water to drain behind it or in front of it rather between the insulation and the Tyvek that is right here that's kind of belt and suspenders it's a it's a insurance essentially for um, the water that might you know make its way in through here insulation continuous on the outside right um, right it's not in the stud cavity we don't have places where uh, there's going to be thermal bridging through the structure and so forth. Um, also, this does a great job of providing air tightness, so we have good control over that the air, the warm air that we have inside the greenhouse now. Um, and then jumping ahead a little bit, um, there's a, you might notice in these uh, <laughs> in this series of photos a little bit of discontinuity in that um, we had originally intended to start building these in fall of 2019. And, uh, you know, so our best intentions, we started getting going, we we're going to build the shell structure first so that we'd have a nice cozy environment in which to be able to work to finish out all the other stuff inside, including installation of the duct for the uh, thermal energy storage. Um, you know, had we known how long it was actually going to take to uh, do this, um, note that that's just prior to spring of 2020 when COVID just came launching forth, you know, um, we probably would have done the thermal energy storage system first and then built the shell around that. That would be my recommendation for anybody moving ahead. Um, but in this case, we've got essentially the shell is completed. Um, we don't have any duct work in. We don't have any internal circulation fans to kind of mix uh, the air inside. Um, but this uh, part of this, this green, particular greenhouse was built over what had previously been some uh, some garden beds uh, the year before. And so we're actually seeing, you know, this is um, early March uh, 2021, these tomato starts coming up just as volunteers. 
because it's now warm enough inside the greenhouse. You can see this snapshot of, um, you know, during this day, it was, you know, bright, sunny in the middle of the day, 10 a.m., uh, 34 degrees outside and 91 degrees uh, inside the greenhouse. And this is, again, just with the uh, structure, um, the, the shell structure. Um, the, for the, again, like I mentioned, part of the, the issue is that we were trying not to go too deep. We're trying to tread relatively lightly on these, on these plots. And so one of the ways we did that uh, from an insulation perspective was to put in what we call um, a skirt insulation. This is also known as a shallow frost protected footing or um, the Swedish skirt uh, is also another term for it. And basically what that is, is a horizontal um, uh, layer of insulation that goes essentially just under the soil surface around the entire perimeter of the greenhouse. And that basically keeps this kind of bubble of heat in the ground underneath and prevents it from, you know, basically from cold and, and frost from making its way down below the foundation and back into the space, right? And so it essentially works whether you flip this down or flip this out, right? Um, as you'd see, you know, vertically in most in most frost priest types of situations. So here's a shot of that. This is actually that, um, that insulation. Um, it's also worth pointing out at this point that this is XPS or extruded polystyrene. Um, and the black or the gray stuff up here, this is the expanded polystyrene. Expanded polystyrene will take on moisture over time if it is put in a, you know, uh, it will saturate essentially, right? And so there's the potential of that happening if it's below grade. So extruded polystyrene, on the other hand, does not saturate, right? Because of the skin that's created during the manufacturing process, it effectively has a waterproof layer on the outside. So that's why we put this um, in the ground and not use the uh, the gray stuff in the ground. Okay, so again, little slightly higher, actually considerably higher um, uh, environmental impacts from the manufacturer of the uh, extruded polystyrene. But in this particular case, this is what we need to put in there so it doesn't lose its insulative capacity. Um, so uh, we had mentioned before about different types of thermal energy storage. Um, the V two point two designs, the you know the 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 big gray ones with the steep glazing wall. Those all used a uh, rock bed thermal storage, um, as uh, had been illustrated in that one schematic where it shows the air going in the top and then going through those horizontal plenums and then through the rock bed. Um, we again, because we we're trying to not go too deeply into the the site um, on these two Minneapolis locations, um, we used uh, a different technique called a uh, transit duct system. Essentially, this uses a shallow transit duct system. And this essentially we had we excavated dig, dug trenches actually for each of these um, narrow or three inch diameter ducts that were then buried in the soil, right? And so the soil gets packed back on top of that. They're each connected to these uh, manifolds at either end of the greenhouse, right? This is essentially the north side of the greenhouse. This is the south side of the greenhouse. The glazing wall would be, you know, coming down right here. Um, Essentially, they're still grabbing the warm air from the peak of the greenhouse and drawing that down into this um, this manifold. Um, it's important to note that the uh, intake is in this corner and the exhaust is in this corner. What this does is essentially make sure that there's relatively even airflow through each of these transit ducts. If we have the intake duct coming down in the middle of the manifold and the exhaust coming out in the middle, similar to what we had in the 2.2 design, Basically, we've got some ducts, transit ducts, that are carrying all of the air through there. And uh, these ones on the ends, they're not carrying as much heat, essentially, right? So we're losing the potential to actually carry the heat through there. Placing these on opposite corners, that basically evens out the amount of air that's traveling through each of these, these transit ducts, okay? Um, again, you know, the soil gets covered back over the top of these uh, three-inch ducts, and the soil is what's actually acting as the thermal energy storage in this case. We're actually trying to heat up the soil with the warm air that we uh, have drawn in here, and then the soil stores that heat and gradually re-radiates that out into the space at night. So here's a picture of um, the intake duct. Here's the fan. We actually have it on the positive pressure side. We're blowing the air down into the system in this case. Um, that's largely because we just didn't have the same amount of space as we did um, in the V2.2, where we had the fan on the other side, where it was sucking air out of the system in the rock bed systems. Um, but they're they're basically working about the same. Um, I did also want to note that it gets really hot in there. Um, 
So this is a shot of uh, some of the exterior insulation that was being stored in one of the greenhouses in the summertime. Again, they had it locked up tight because they were worried about site security issues. And, uh, you know, so this was in the middle of July 2021. Um, it was probably 120 degrees or so, 125 something in the greenhouse, plus the direct sun coming in created enough heat that it actually melted the surfaces of the expanded polystyrene in this case. You can kind of see where there was a little more shade. It didn't quite melt as much. And this is just from those purlins on the glazing wall, right? So pretty amazing combination between the interior ambient heat and the direct uh, extra heat added by this direct sunlight. Um, so this is all to say that ventilation is crucial <laughs> in these structures, um, especially if you're trying to do anything during the summer. Again, note this is, you know, in some of the hottest you know, longest days of the year where you're getting the most solar gain, the sun is highest in the sky. So where it's really, you know, coming into that, that shallower glazing wall that we have on this particular structure. Um, but we need, we need ventilation in here. We need to be able to exhaust that. Um, jumping ahead a little bit here to uh, actually getting stuff going in the greenhouses. So this was the first uh, instance of germination that we had in uh, one of the farm scale winter greenhouses. This was in the Aptec for change one. Um, so they built raised beds, filled them with a compost mix that they had just ordered, um, and then they broadcast uh, uh, seeds in here. Um, so this also then, this is actually from um, earlier this winter, this is late 2022, that would be, um, they were growing head lettuce for a restaurant in St. Paul, um, and then also some other smaller mesogreens here um, in these beds. Um, just to give you a sense of um, what else people are doing in here? There's a. Uh, this is actually in the same structure as that. All those head lettuces and so forth. There's um, basil going here. There's uh, some cilantro here. There's onions going here. There's uh, some Costa Rican hot pepper and actually back here is some sugarcane um, that they were growing. Um, uh, I'll point out that you know the. Optimal growing conditions for the head lettuce is not the same as the optimal growing conditions for the basil and the cilantro and the, the peppers and so forth. So, you know, they were still just kind of figuring out what they wanted to do in this space. Um, I don't know if they've actually, you know, taken a particular path on that yet, but um, this does go to, go to show that uh, you can grow all kinds of stuff in here very successfully. Um, they also were trying to figure out what they could do with the structure during the summer when there was more heat, right? And really, they just decided to try out other heat-loving crops, you know, stuff that would grow more successfully in Central American or, you know, Southern U.S. type of environment. And so they did sweet potatoes, they did watermelon, they did uh, okra. Um, and then, as you saw, there was that uh, Costa Rican hot pepper and um, the, um, the sugar cane. So I'm excited to see what else, you know, people are growing in these. Here is an example from the other site. Um, this is at the Tamale CBC Cletas location in South Minneapolis. And uh, again, just to show you some, some of the different approaches that people are taking, these are um, climbing peas. And I, I think this was, this must have been the middle of February uh, this, that I took this particular shot of 2023. Um, and you'll notice, you know, green's just going for it, you know, Tatsoi, bok choy, some mizuna in here, um, you know, some chard and so forth. Um, but then I also want to point out this other structure in here is where they've actually created another kind of low tunnel inside of this larger structure. So they're able to get different microclimate environments within the larger deep winter greenhouse structure. And so maybe you've got, you know, a cooler, quote, a cooler environment in the rest of the structure, but you're able to maintain um, you know, a smaller space with warmer stuff. And that's where they were starting their onions, their tomatoes, and uh, cucumbers inside there. And they actually had a little space here going inside of that, uh, that low tunnel. Um, you know, again, great way to have a little bit more control over a smaller space if you're trying to maximize that. The other thing I like about this that I'll, I'll point out is that they're, they've got their, uh, you know, their 10, or I guess these are <laughs> 510 trays, right? Um, where they're germinating seeds, uh, right on top of the garden bed. And so you can both plant directly into the bed and, you know, start your stuff right in the spaces in between. As your stuff in the, in the bed starts to mature, they're already, you know, that's when these ones can go out and get transplanted out to the field. You're basically maximizing use of this space, um, you know, this very precious space um, that, you're, that you're trying to maintain. 
some close-up shots of uh, that one and jump forward then again, um, looking at the expenses. How does this actually turn out? Um, I'll, uh, um, so I'm actually really ha happy with this kind of uh, set of, of data because these are, you know, these are direct taken directly from the receipts. Um, so they're very accurate. Um, the, uh, the glazing wall, and this includes the polycarbonate glazing, this includes the trusses, it includes the fasteners to put all that stuff on. That was almost 8K. Uh, the insulation for the wall, um, that was about two grand. The ductwork, that's all of the, you know, the larger diameter, that's a uh, eight inch diameter stuff that is the intake and the exhaust and the manifolds. Um, and then also all the three inch duct, um, that was uh, about two and a half K. Um, the grade beam, as I mentioned, and also uh, it's also important that we uh, are, you know, we've got a foundation that's keeping the thing uh, down. You know, the structural engineer has reviewed this. So there is a structural stamp on the plan set uh, available for download. And uh, they were not really concerned about loading, right? Things, you know, pushing down into the ground, you know, and the foundation being adequate to support that. They were more concerned about if this was going to be uh, built in a high wind location, or if, if there was a, you know, high wind event, like a tornado or something coming through, that it stayed anchored down. And so we have ground anchors, earth anchors that actually keep um, that grade beam uh, screwed down, essentially, to the ground. Um, framing sheeting, this is all of the, the studs and the uh, XPS, about 5k. Fasteners quite a bit, because we've got those long fasteners that are going through the wall section. Um, these are the backup heaters. We've got two, basically they're a, an electric shop heater. There's one on each end of the greenhouse. And again, this is our insurance, you know, like I, I'm not going to say that this is completely off the grid. I'm not going to say that this is completely passively heated, right? We need some insurance as is typical here in Minnesota and the upper Midwest. We've got a couple cloudy days, you know, coming into February or, um, you know, just times when we're going to need that backup heating, right? And so this is relatively cheap insurance. Here's our siding. That's the metal uh, um, corrugated siding um, and the lumber for the raised beds. I also point out with this particular greenhouse, uh, there were a couple of site specific costs that um, made it somewhat expensive. And that was that they had to get a new feed from, you know, from the power lines out on the street. They had to put up a new power pole and a new meter and everything. And that in itself cost almost 15K. And then they needed a new water line coming from the water main out under the street you know, brought in with a curb stop and all that kind of stuff. And that was also 9K. So those two items themselves, you know, added quite a bit of expense to it. Overall, that was almost 50K, but the uh, expenses just for the shell itself were just over 26K. Um, so depending, you know, and granted, this is a uh, costs from three years ago now. So, you know, there's likely going to be um, somewhat higher. However, lumber has gone back down now. Um, so, you know, maybe this line item will be down a little bit, um, but, you know, this will kind of give you a decent idea. This equates to about $25 a square foot versus the V2.2 design, which was about mm, $75 a square foot. So, um, boy, and uh, I, we're right at time. I'm going to go just a little bit longer because we started late. <laughs> But uh, I'll just go through this. These are fancy charts, right? Just uh, we're tracking temperature and humidity and uh, difference in temperature um, in the, from the interior to the exterior. This is basically showing that before we had any ductwork installed, before the fans were running, it's basically keeping the structures about 30 or it's keeping the, the enclosure about 30 degrees warmer than it is outside. And that's during really cold periods here. You know, we've, we're getting down to like, you know, 10 below. Uh, this would have been February of uh, 2022. Um, yeah, again, before the thermal energy storage stuff had been commissioned and, and was ready for operation. So essentially, we know this is working. This is uh, November 2022, um, where they had, um, you know, we can see they've turned on their, their uh, backup heating. We can see it cycling, right? This is where those shop heaters are kicking in to help keep the temperature right at about 45 degrees. And then you can actually see here where they turn the temperature up. Uh, I think they boosted it up to like 65 degrees or something here. And so now the temperature is way up here. Of course, they're using a lot more energy. Um, but, uh, you know, there's, there's some options here. Looking at a little finer granularity and really how much does this cost to operate? This is a week-long period in February of 2023, you know, where the temperature outside 
uh, you know, we're down in the 10 degrees, we're vacillating between, um, you know, around 25, maybe highs of up to about 40 in the daytime, right? Um, basically, we're trying to keep the greenhouse temperature right here about 50 degrees, and that's costing us, you know, and the worst, coldest nights, you know, clearest nights where it's uh, really demanding a lot, we're about $8 a day for backup heating. Um, stepping, you know, looking out a little bit, monthly cost, this is December 22 for the Tamale CD Cicletas greenhouse, about 250 bucks worth of heating, another 250 in January 23. Going down now in February, I think it's probably because we had a little bit more sun um, in February than January, so we're down to about 184 bucks. And then going up in March, probably because it was a little bit clouder, but temperatures were still really cold. And then surprisingly, uh, this is um, April of uh, 2023, 140 bucks of backup heating. Um, so just to give you a sense. And then I'll let Greg jump in with this one. And I think we're just at the end. So. Yeah, okay. Uh, so this slide here is um, my attempt to cobble together what economic data we do have and, um, and make it relevant for the farm scale greenhouse. So um, if you look up here, Greenhouses one, two, three, four, five, and six, and eight. These are the um, uh, gross revenues, operating expenses, et cetera, for uh, greenhouses that are more likely, I think, along the lines of the farm scale greenhouse, the smaller greenhouse. Greenhouse seven is the economic information we have from a greenhouse that is much larger than the others and probably more on the lines of what the farm scale greenhouse is in terms of dimensions. Uh, this, these are data that have been collected by Ryan Pesch. He's an economic uh, educator. He's an extension educator uh, in community economics, or he was at this time. And he has been active in working with deep winter greenhouse producers. So what we can see on the top line here, gross revenue, these are the numbers that the, uh, that the growers brought in, the amount of money they brought in per year. <clears throat> the the problems we have with this is there are so few actual deep winter greenhouse producers that are growing for a business for money that we don't actually get a large over overview of what the industry might look like. But this is these are the numbers we have, so it's the best that we have to work with. So if you were to look at greenhouse one, for example, they brought in thirty one hundred dollars, three thousand one hundred and fifty dollars in sales from their deep winter greenhouse. They spent one thousand eight hundred and seventeen dollars on um on things that they needed to make their greenhouse operate their operating revenue which brings us to an operating revenue of square foot of about three dollars and 40 cents so when you do all of that numbers when you look at all these numbers and look at how much they worked they made about four dollars and 61 cents per hour not the best however when we look at greenhouse two and three Two brought in $2,500, three brought in $4,800. Their operating revenues uh, below here um, are, I'm sorry, the operating revenue is, is, the, is the revenue you bring in minus the expenses that you incurred to bring that revenue in, not counting the construction costs. So um, two and three, when we look at that, their operating revenues were $2,000 and $3,000 respectively. There's the square foot numbers. And then if you look down at the bottom, we, we like to uh, estimate the hourly wage to kind of give people a sense of how much money they're making uh, compared to the amount of time they're putting in there. So $23 per hour and $10 an hour. Not as bad. One of them's pretty good. One of them's, you know, not as bad. But when we look at, when we think about what's going on here, these are small greenhouses. These are 20 feet by 20 foot greenhouses. How do we extrapolate those numbers in um, <clears throat> when we're looking at the, the farm scale greenhouse? Greenhouse seven is more of a farm scale greenhouse type of design. This is one person. So you take it for what it's worth. It's worth one person's uh, gross revenue and operating revenue. Now, I think I'm not 100% sure, but I think that this greenhouse is located in a very remote area in uh, one of the Dakotas. So this isn't someone who likely has access to high scale markets in Madison, Minneapolis, Northfield, Rochester, you know, like something like that. But this person was still able to bring in almost $9,000 um, minus expenses, brought in $6,600. We look down at the bottom, calculating the hourly, hourly wage, we're looking at $54 per hour. That's pretty good. So in my mind, the way I can calculate these 
uh, make sense of these numbers is this might not be correct because this is just taking in cobbling together a couple of people and cherry picking because we're leaving out the people that didn't perform well. But what I'm thinking, what I'm seeing out of this is if you build a greenhouse and you're successful at marketing your crop and you know who your audience is and you know what you're doing, uh, you, you could probably make a pretty good amount of money at doing this. You're probably not going to be, um, you know, retiring in 10 years out of this or, you know, buying a big house or fancy car or something like that. But for farm work, it's pretty good. It's looking like it, when I see this, I see that this can be a very important tool for small farmers that they can use to make an additional income stream on their farm in the time of year when they're not currently potentially making money if they're just doing veggies. And this could really round out a whole farm system. So that's how I see these numbers. And granted, there are only eight greenhouses here, three of which aren't actually making very much money or maybe even not even selling very much of their crop in the first place. So these are the numbers we have. Hopefully in a couple of years, more and more people are building greenhouses. We'll be able to come back and do these numbers and get maybe more accurate or these might not be inaccurate, but we'll get a better picture um, overlooking larger set of producers to kind of get a better sense of what it actually is. This is what we have now. I think it's very promising, but that's all we got. So with that, um, I'd also, Greg, can I jump in here real quickly just to bookend that, um, you know, you presented a lot of, you know, kind of larger systemic reasons for why we might want to see more deep winter greenhouses out on the landscape at the beginning. And I also wanted to say, you know, like there is a commercial justification for why you'd want to do this. Like you can actually make money doing this. But I would say another important thing is that it's just a fantastic space to work in <laughs> and just it's unreal taking people through these during the middle of the winter time and the opportunity to, you know, to just be in a warm, green, lush environment in the middle of the winter time is just uh, it's such a needed experience, I think, for many of us up here in the upper Midwest. So um, and I, I also think that they in the places where I've been various places where these have been built they they do create they start building that um community of people that that meet each other and understand that this has value to them not only just for themselves personally but also for their community absolutely absolutely that's right and if it oh go ahead oh no you can go you i don't want to interrupt you <laughs> well i i have actually if if we can if we can end this or maybe but i have a couple of questions for dan um, about the larger greenhouses. Can I ask those or should we just quit and I'll just send him an email? We can keep going. I have some questions too. So if we if we think it's valuable, like I think the questions I have are pretty quick and you could ask yours too, if you guys have time. You go ahead and go first. Well, before okay. we go, I yeah, just want to point out here that this website down here, z.umn.edu backslash dwg underscore resources will bring you to our Deep Winter Greenhouse resource webpage where you can download all of these designs. You can look at our planting guides. You can get case studies of other people doing it. You can kind of look at everything we've got to date about Deep Winter Greenhouses. And um, that's, uh, that's your go-to spot to get into this and so if you have specific questions, that. you can write Greg. <laughs> I distribute Greg. all the questions to the correct people, even if I don't answer them myself. So yeah, um, send your questions to me. With that, I'll let you guys ask your questions too. Okay, awesome. I'll try to be quick. Um, but um, the first one was just like a bigger picture of like where you see um, these deep winter greenhouses being applicable in the U.S. So like what is like the regionality? Where have you seen these being built? Like how far south would you say you could go? And then maybe after that, it doesn't make sense. Um, the, well, that's a great question, partly because the structure is designed for our latitude, right? Yeah. Um, it's designed to be you know, to, to respond to where the sun is literally in relation to where we are on the surface of the planet. So um, I would say that this design is effective within probably mm, 40 degrees north latitude to maybe 55 degrees north latitude, something like that. Um, of course, it's still going to work pretty well um, outside of that probably all the way down to 30 degrees, you know, north latitude. But 
if you're getting down to that, um, you know, that's pretty far south in the in the states at that it's point. It's kind of right? overkill around... at that point. Isn't well, it? yeah, you don't need a deep winter greenhouse at that point. Yeah, right? they're using hoop houses down there. Right, exactly. So, or they've got a longer growing season, quite frankly, right? Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the farther north you get, really, the more vertical you want to go toward, um, because you can still get really good solar gain. And there's a, there's a case to be made for actually insulating the roof at that point. Um, to try and keep more heat in there, right? Um, uh, so, and it that makes some of the construction a little bit more simple. Um, I guess, you know, as far as like a larger vision, I, you know, I'd love to see these just kind of scattered about as a dispersed kind of um, food production model. You know, like we've seen, of course, there's good success with these large, you know, acres under hydroponic uh, operation, you know, around the country quite frankly and they're 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 doing well they're growing a lot of food um but you know i think that's one end of the spectrum right and i'd like to see you know more of these um provide you know different types of opportunities both for growers and consumers um and also the the fact is like they they create some resilience in our in our food system um they create the opportunity for you know uh tribal or um you know indigenous groups to be able to grow what it is that they want to grow or immigrant communities. You know, I know of, of one example where they're actually, they're um, actually the TYB greenhouse. They're, they're partnering with um, a, a, a group from Rwanda to try and grow crops that simply, you know, they can't get here in the States, but it requires a different growing, growing environment than we have typically. So um, I look at it as a way to diversify and um, supplement and uh, create more resiliency in the food system quite, all, you know, quite frankly. Awesome. I, would, I would add there a bit of caution. There are places where you don't want to build these and they're kind of ironically some of the more uh, the, the heavier specialty crop producing areas in the upper Midwest and that's east of a Great Lake. So Western <laughs> Michigan, New York State, um, the UP, there it's just too cloudy. Yeah, these that, things don't work all, well. You know, they it. rely on the sun. So <laughs> before you do anything, get a solar site assessment to make sure you've got, you know, got enough sun in there. Is there a way to compensate for that? I mean, can they get into some kind of low cost? Sure. Light? I mean, there's all kinds of different systems you can put in, you know, as far as backup heating. Mm -hmm. People put in rocket stoves. People put in, you know, mass heaters. They put in all kinds of different things. That's on the heat side. Of mm -hmm. course, if you're concerned about light, you know, there's all kinds of cool LED, yeah. supplement, LED growing lights and so forth that you know, they use relatively less uh, energy, but um, they still use quite a bit. They're not cheap. The other cool thing, though, about LEDs is that they still give off a fair amount of heat. And so depending on how airtight your structure is, you can actually utilize the, quote, waste heat of the LED or the growing light to help heat the greenhouse. Yeah. And typically you're doing that when the sun isn't shining anyway. So it's a nice, you know, it's a nice systemic kind of balance. So for the farm scale, do you have a sense, I mean, I know you've got a couple of prototypes that are a certain size and, and that it can be built outward more, but how small can it be and still perform well? That's a good question. I'd probably, I'd probably go, I'd probably only go like 40 feet in the east-west dimension by 20 um, mm -hmm. because, you know, eventually you start to get you know too narrow this way and then you wind up being longer in the north south direction so that's are you talking you're talking the old the smaller greenhouse the 2.2 right 40 feet wide by 20 the farm scale greenhouse is already 60 feet or so well, right. she i was, was asking, asking about, about the farm scale yeah oh, okay. she was talking about shortening the if it can scale. be a little okay. shorter than the ones got it, got that it. built so far or if it starts to just not work that's good to know yeah um, i, I kind of had a question about the design too like if like, because the first images you showed from like the 90s or whatever, it was like ones that were connected to another structure. Mm -hmm. And maybe some people still would have that option. And then the one, um, the then you have the two newer models that are standalone. So like if a farmer has the option of deciding between the standalone or like building it onto a structure, what would you recommend? Uh, another great question. I would say... If you have an existing structure that is not a residence, <laughs> um, then go for it. I think the a deep winter greenhouse pairs 
perfectly with something like an outbuilding or a barn or you know a shed or a garage um but i would strongly caution against attaching a well really a structure that generates heat and humidity to a residence without getting a really good sense of how that heat and humidity is going to move through the wall into well, well, and then stay in the wall, quite frankly. You know, there's a lot of moisture issues. If things aren't deal, dealt with or designed well, um, then, you know, you can rot your house. And that's really what nobody wants. And so I, I generally, of course, it can be done. You know, talk to a building science expert, talk to a really good builder who knows how to detail things correctly. Um, and of course, it can be done. But I, I just generally tend to say, like, attach it to an outbuilding or, you know, something out there or, or do standalone. Um, our designs are standalone just because we don't, you know, we don't anticipate that everybody's going to have the exact perfect structure to build onto. Um, so, and, you know, some of the designs can be partially adapted um, to be able to attach to something, but it's, uh, yeah, you know, it, we're just trying to keep our realm of control relatively simple, you know, without yep. having too many different permutations. Awesome. And then I just have two quick questions that were like more production questions. One was for Carol around like, um, in the ones you showed, there was more like um, vertical growing and like the hanging baskets and stuff. I was wondering how the how did the irrigation work in those structures? Like I know they're in a drain, so it, in my mind I was like there must be some sort of irrigation. But were you just watering those or? Well, my structure's small enough that I can just water by hand, and and I like to do that because my my hands are kind of like a, a bread makers where I can just feel when it's right. So I like to get my hands in there and the watering thing is, is kind of a Zen thing for me for starters, because the greenhouse sort of invokes that, but um, it gives me also the opportunity to do some careful um, observations. I do a lot of journaling in my greenhouse about what's growing, how it's doing, was there mold, is there a problem somewhere, what did you do to deal with it, you know, and, and tracking on the growth and all that stuff. So that's just kind of part of my ritual in maintaining the greenhouse. It includes being able to water by hand because I can. Mm. And I think a drip irrigation in there with the kind of system that I have would be really awkward. Um, but also it just, it just pleases me and it really doesn't take a lot of time. And do you use a hose or do you use a watering can? This is kind of getting into the I use theory. a hose. Yeah. <laughs> I have one of those curly Q things so I can just bring it around wherever I need to have it in the greenhouse. Yep. Awesome. And, the, and it's not like I'm dragging a hose around, you know, so it's, it's, uh, yeah. But enjoyable. Victoria, I think these are really, it's actually a really important question, um, especially because we, you know, because it's so cold and dry outside during the middle of the winter time. We want to try and, of course, you know, like really pay attention to and limit the amount of, you know, heat and humidity that we're generating within the greenhouse just to kind of reduce the chances of any kind of rot and excess condensation happening. Right. And so I'm a huge fan of really controlled irrigation. Like mm -hmm. I see people with like a breaker and a wand, you know, like just spraying willy nilly in the deep winter greenhouse. And I'm like, ah! you know, yeah. just because it's wasting the water, first of all. Right. It's not going to the plants generally. Right. Some of it is. But, you know, a lot of it's just getting sprayed on the ground or something. It's not a garden. You know, think of it more as like, a, you know, it's it's hot house. <laughs> well, yeah. Right. You know, it's like you want to like put things where they're supposed to go. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing is then it just generates all this excess humidity, which, again, then it's not useful for the plants yeah. either. Right. Well, and having that regular kind of ritual of that, that minimalistic watering provides a, a simple way to be checking plants mm -hmm. because you really do have to watch in case for some god awful reason, some pest got in there. Um, because especially with aphids, that's generally been the biggie in the deep winter greenhouses. And, you know, they're underneath leaves they're at the very you know, point where a leaf is branching out and they're all just sucking up all that juice and they're the same color as the stems so you really have to put an eye on it and it doesn't take very long when you're growing like that to be able to identify when something's up you can see the result of some kind of pest on the plant before you maybe even see the pests but it does require that that conscious observation and it's an easy thing to do while you're watering 
So it's a, a mixed, you know, it's just a thing that I do to keep the plants healthy. Yeah, that sounds like an amazing ritual. Um, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> and I love you're talking about record keeping. I'm like so bad at that, but it's something that's so important. Well, all you need is a Ziploc bag and one of those small little spiral things. And, and it's just a matter of, of observation. But then you actually have to write in it, Carol. That's the important thing that a lot of people miss. Oh, yeah. Well, there's like <laughs> two pens in there just in case I lose one. Big surprise. Yeah. And, but, you know, what's great about that, too, is that it, it kind of becomes your own growing manual, because if you do that each year, a new one each year, it helps you if you create, if there's a problem that you're trying to address, well, what did I do, you know, when this happened before, and you just build on it. Um, so that's a pretty nice thing. And what I wanted to ask Dan also, uh, as far as like, in these larger greenhouses where there's, there's, you know, you want to make sure that ventilation's good and all that kind of stuff. I know that you've been looking at um, thermal curtains. What is that looking like as, as a good addition to the deep winter greenhouses? Well, I'm optimistic. Uh, the curtain, so I had a specialty crop block grant from the Minnesota Department of Ag to look into, um, I don't know what, I don't know what the right title is yet. Is it a thermal curtain? Is it a blanket? Is it a quilt? I, I you know, I don't, I don't quite know yet, but it's basically just a, a, a way to provide some additional insulation on the glazing wall whenever the sun isn't shining, right? Because mm. um, obviously we need the glazing wall to get, allow heat and light to pass into the greenhouse, but if the sun isn't out, then it's a huge actual liability for us because that is yeah. the point where most of the heat leaves the greenhouse and it's a lot of surface area, right? Mm -hmm. So um, if we can, you know, better keep the heat in, you know, we're going to get better performance. So um, I'm testing a number of different uh, assemblies, essentially different types of curtains. Um, and, uh, you know, really, it's it's pretty promising at this point. Um, however, I have been going out and, you know, putting the curtains on and taking the curtains off by hand um, and affixing them with screws. It's not that's not a sustainable method. And so the other portion of this um, of this project, of the research project is to figure out a deployment method as well. Um, I'm in conversations with a couple fabricators, and uh, again, they sound very out there, like, "Oh yeah, this is easy to do." So I'm, I'm, mm. I'm hoping it's as easy as they say, um, but but we'll see. Really, I mean, that's that's really what this research project is meant to do: is to kind of see what we can do with that. How easy can we make this? Um, of course, there's different approaches to how you try and keep heat in. Many people will use interior insulation um, that they'll put in and take out, you know, on a daily basis. Um, or curtains that they, you know, deploy on the interior of the space by the, you know, manually. Um, but uh, from a performance standpoint, it's really more effective to have it around the outside. You know, like, like again, these these exterior control layers that are continuous, right? That's what I'm trying to do with uh, the insulation on the glazing wall as well. And so, um, but of course that brings along a whole host of issues, wind, snow, ice, rain, freezing you know like you name it right this is the upper midwest these are exactly the conditions that we're trying to foil um and so figuring out the right materials that are going to shed that and a robust enough deployment mechanism that's uh, you know that isn't affected by it I don't know. those are the big issues so we'll see okay and, one more question oh, yeah, and my, oh ahead. okay okay yeah. and then i have to go yeah sorry <laughs> so sorry about the newer designs in the twin cities where you put the duck structure in the soil like right beneath the surface and then i saw the raised beds is there any issue with like roots growing into the duck structure or no 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 concerns with that no not at all actually the the um the three inch ducks are non-perforated right and so they're oh, yeah, literally right. they're relying on the heat to basically transfer or conduct through the plastic wall of the duct uh, into the surrounding soil, right? The nice thing is they're a small enough diameter that you know they're getting lots of surface area as they're moving through there, and so there's a good chance that it's moving through there or moving from you know the air into the soil. Um, so that's not an issue necessarily. Um, the other thing is you know most of those raised beds are you know, there's probably eight inches at least of soil in there. Plus there's another maybe six to eight to 12 inches of soil, you know, between the soil surface above the ducts. And so that's, you know, that's 
quite a depth. So unless you're growing something that's got a really deep taproot or some kind of, you know, longer growing root uh, crop, then that's not going to be an issue. You know, for most of the greens and so forth, they're they're pretty shallow. So yeah, no problems there. Awesome. The last thing that I want to touch on with you, Dan, is I'm really curious to find out the thing that I get asked so often when people contact me about wanting to do this is how do I find people who can build this? That's a great question as well. Um, I always tell people that if they can find a builder who can follow plans, that's a good start. <laughs> um, the other kind of caveat to that is um, finding somebody that understands building science and how moisture moves through a wall assembly. You know, a lot of people, maybe they've built for most of their lives and, you know, think they have a pretty good understanding, but there's a set of, you know, just knowing how basically humid air, <laughs> um, how it moves through uh, structures is, is really important for the longevity of this. If you're going to be building with a wood structure, which, you know, at this point, I'm still recommending. Um, but interestingly, we're also involved with another project to try and um, we're working with on the White Earth Reservation with a group up there called the Ogamo Organics. Um, and they're um, actually trying to do a workforce development program as part of constructing a couple deep winter greenhouses up there so that they will have um, you know, a, a trained crew, essentially, that's familiar with how these things go together and all the considerations that go into uh, how they're constructed. So there's a yeah. start, right? You know, I mean, there's not a whole lot of them out there, but, um, you know, hopefully as demand grows and as capacity grows, we'll see more and more of them. So, yeah. That sounds oh, good. Can we contact Greg to find a builder or would that be a little much? You can contact me. I'll tell you just what Dan said. Nice. <laughs> All <laughs> I right. told someone that just yesterday. Nice. Well, thank you, right. everyone. This is great. Thanks for staying a little longer. And I'll share the YouTube recording once you have it. Sounds good. Thanks very much for having Thanks. us. Thanks, Victoria. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye, guys.